Hello everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Harpreet Kaur, Senior Endodontist associated with the Academy of Dental Excellence. I have an experience of seven years in clinical practice as well as academic. You know, amidst all the negativity that is surrounding all of us during this COVID-19 pandemic, one thing which I figured out, I found positive is that this is the time, this is the actual time we all have. We have an excellent opportunity to just stop, you know, think, relearn and improve. Be it any skill that we couldn't hone earlier, or maybe we didn't have the time to give it to ourselves. As we say that learning is actually a continuously evolving process. So one can, can learn from anywhere, everywhere. It's just your will and determination that actually matters. We must not stop just because we cannot go outside, we cannot go out to study, to practice, or we cannot reach out to the specialist. You know, rather we must improvise. That is more important. You know what, you must have heard about it. It's survival of the fittest. Or else I can say that necessity is the mother of all invention. So taking motivation from all these quotations, our academy, that is the Academy of Dental Excellence, is going digital. We are coming live. We are coming to you guys so that you don't stop because we'll never stop. We are bringing online courses with attractive study packages, basically covering all the aspects of clinical dentistry. These attractive packages are surely going to be a heavy food to your mind, but lighter to your pocket. Then coming on to my topic of today's webinar, it's excess cavity preparation. What actually made me choose this topic is, this is one of the topics that is least spoken about, that is least discussed about. So basically, we are always emphasizing more on the further steps of root canal treatment, mainly the biomechanical preparation. We know all the techniques, all the best rotary endodontic materials that are available to us, following the chemical debridement of the root canal system, and then three-dimensional sealing that we call obturation of the root canal system. So my agenda here is to fill up the very basic. What is this very basic? According to me, it is the excess cavity preparation. You must have heard about the quote that is excess to success. Actually, all the root canal treatment steps, the BMP, the chemical irrigation, the obturation, and the endodontic restoration, the success of all these steps actually relies on the very first step that is your excess cavity preparation. So let's just have a brief discussion about the clinical aspects of excess cavity preparation. I hope this is going to help you guys in your clinical practice. Starting with our presentation now, let's just discuss about excess cavity preparations introduction. Firstly, according to the definition, what an excess cavity preparation is, it is actually defined as the opening in the surface of a tooth to gain an entrance to the root canal system for the purpose of cleaning, shaping, and obturating the root canal. Essentially, excess cavity is vital for allowing the effective cleaning, shaping, and obturation of the root canal system. Then coming on to the objectives. Endodontically speaking, according to me, the objectives of excess cavity preparation are actually confirmed when a clinician is able to see all the root canal orifices in the floor of the pulp chamber without having to move your mouth mirror. Right? So now we'll discuss these objectives one by one. What is basically our aim? We have to reach to a certain goal. For reaching that goal, we need to fulfill all the objectives of excess cavity preparation. Starting with the first very important objective, that is to remove all the caries. Let the carious lesion actually guide you to the root canal orifices. This is the first and foremost step to remove all the carious part from the tooth. And then progress towards locating the root canal orifices. Even a single point of carious lesion that is left in the cavity is going to definitely cause the failure of your root canal procedure. Because any left pulpal remnant subsequently undergoes necrosis and thus leads to the failure of your treatment. Second, it is an objective to conserve the sound tooth structure. 
while removing the kerry or your previous restoration one must keep in mind that the sound tooth structure that actually remains behind is going to provide support to the tooth to bear all the masticatory forces so it is of utmost importance that we conserve as much as sound tooth structure as possible then is unroofing of the pulp chamber i really want to discuss this point basically what happens is supposedly we are starting with the excess opening of a maxillary central incisor we all know that we'll start it from the lingual surface in the center of the tooth we'll place our round bar and get a drop in effect into the pulp chamber as soon as we actually get a drop in effect in the pulp chamber we start putting our files into the root canal system and once our file goes easily into the root canal system there where that's where we feel that we are done with the excess cavity is that actually the excess cavity is that actually the aim of the excess cavity i mean just removing or unroofing the pulp chamber does not lead to an excess cavity preparation there are certain extensions of the roof of pulp chamber which are called as pulp horns which need to be removed along with the roof of the pulp chamber so that there is no remaining pulp tissue vital or necrotic left in your excess cavity preparation then once we are done with the removal of all the pulp tissue that is the roof the floor the axial walls of the pulp removing all the tissue from all these areas of the pulp chamber we go to locate all the root canal orifices for location of root canal orifices we have a large number of instruments which i'll be discussing further then the next objective is to achieve a straight line access to the apical foramen but keep it in mind it is not always directly the apical foramen you have to start from the coronal one third moving on to the middle one third and then reaching to the apical one third then last but not the least objective this is the most important one to establish the restorative margins to minimize your marginal leakage of the restored tooth this is a very important objective which is actually going to help your tooth to bear the masticatory loads after the completion of your root canal treatment coming on to the armamentarium that is basically required for preparing the root canal excess cavity preparation starting with the burst so every clinician has his or her favorite set of burst right so in this case i'll start with the round burst they are the most common type of burst that we are usually uh, usually using so we have three sizes of these burst number 2 number 4 and number 6 number 2 being smaller in size it is actually apt to be used in mandibular anteriors that is centrals laterals and canines and maxillary premolar coming to number 4 the number 4 round burst being medium sized burst it is useful in maxillary anterior teeth and mandibular premolar moving ahead to number 6 this is a large sized burst it is to be used for molar teeth then moving on to the next burst that is endo excess burst this one is my personal favorite if you see the picture of this endo excess burst it has got two parts the tip it is a round burst and the shank has also got an abrasive coating now what it helps is you can use this round burst to enter into the roof of the pulp chamber and use the tapered part of the burst to enlarge or flare your excess cavity So this is endo excess burst coming on to the next burst it's a transmetal burst as we can figure out from the picture the transmetal burst has saw tooth shaped configuration of its blades basically what is the benefit of this configuration is it reduces it actually reduces the number of undesirable vibrations which is typically helpful when you are treating a hot tooth the main use of this transmetal burr is it is specifically designed to cut through any of the metal or any previous amalgam restoration then moving on to the excess cavity finishing or flaring burr the burrs that i have already discussed they are actually the burrs which are used for opening into the excess cavity now i am discussing about the burr which is actually used to flare and finish the excess cavity now it's endo z burr it is the burr it has a speciality that you can see it the tip of the burr it is a non cutting end so this gives the benefit that only the shank part is actually going to cut through the tooth structure it is easily placed on the pulpal floor to 
to locate the root canal orifices plus enlarging the root canal excess cavity preparation without having the fear of perforating into the pulpal flow please do try using the endo access bar endo z bar they are actually worth it last is the tapered fissure bar this is a commonly used bar which is basically used to remove the excess of dentine and to cause the flaring of the excess cavity preparation now moving on to the next instrument that is gates gliden drills these are the instruments which are recommended since long particularly for bringing out the flaring of coronal one third of your root canal system however current ideas they actually discourage the use of these gates gliden drills personally i also discourage using the gate gates gliden drills specifically for the enlargement of your coronal one third because this coronal one third of the root canal system is actually the dentine that is lying around your crestal bone so it is very critical right and these gate gg drills actually they hamper that dentine thus making the tooth more vulnerable to fracture moving on to the next instruments we have explorers that is the endodontic explorers and spoon excavators this is an another set of instruments which every clinician must have in his or her kit they are basically used to remove the initial dentine that is actually covering the root canal orifices in the pulpal flow starting with the first instrument it's dg16 it's a form of endodontic explorer the other one is ck17 they are the most common types of endodontic explorers they actually help the tip of these instruments is so fine that when you take this instrument to the pulpal floor it gets itself engaged into the root canal orifice second benefit of using these endodontic explorers is they even help you to determine the angulation of your root just put the tip of this instrument into the root canal orifice hold the instrument with your hand and try to move the instrument in that particular direction this is actually going to help you when you are inserting your file in a particular direction so that there is no instrument breakage on that second instrument that we are going to discuss is endodontic explorer it is just like the other explorer that we are using but the tips of this instrument are also very fine and they help in removing the dentine that is lying over the uh, pulpal floor covering your root canal orifices moving on to endodontic spoon also called as endo spoon it is an excavator just like the excavator we use to remove the carious part of a normal cavity preparation so this endodontic explorer is basically used to remove the undermined enamel just in case of uh, a normal uh, central incisor or a lateral incisor where there are high pulp horns this endo spoon particularly helps you to remove the pulp tissue lying in the pulp horn without having to damage the excessive dentine or the undermined enamel moving on to the next instrument these are the ultrasonic tips as we all know ultrasonics are actually becoming very helpful in almost all the fields of dentistry similarly in endodontics these ultrasonic tips they are of great importance so what is what is that which is making them different from the other tips the end of the working part of these ultrasonic tips the size is at least 10 mm small as compared to the smallest round bar that is available with us secondly the working part of these tips contains certain abrasives which help in removal of the dentine without causing much damage to the sound dentine so it is better if we we can use these ultrasonic tips to locate the calcified canals or to locate the accessory canals like mb2 in maxillary molars now once we are done with the instrumentation or armamentarium i want you to go through certain laws it's all written in your textbook but these laws are actually helpful when we are going through into your tooth right so these laws were basically given by krasner and ranko coming to the first law it's law of centrality what does this law state as we can see in the first picture according to this law all the root canal orifices they lie on the pulpal floor this floor of the pulp chamber is actually located in the center of the clinical crown of the tooth at the level of cemento enamel junction then moving on to the second law that is the law of concentricity what is concentric as 
just imagine certain concentric circles going around each other so this law of concentricity states that if you see the image if there is this is a bulge so you can see the bulge on the lateral wall of the pulp similarly you can see the bulge on the external surface of the tooth here you can see a depression in the lateral wall of the pulp similarly we have a depression in the external surface of the tooth this is what law of concentricity states that the walls of the pulp chamber they are always concentric to the external surface of the tooth at the level of c j right coming on to the next law that is the law of c j now this law of c j states that the distance from the external surface of the clinical crown to the wall lateral walls or axial walls of the pulp chamber is same throughout the circumference of the tooth thereby making this cemento enamel junction the most consistent repeatable landmark to locate the position of your pulp chamber then further moving on to the next law it is the law of color change see whenever we talk about a tooth all the tissues that are present in a tooth they have different colors if we talk about enamel it is usually white i'll not say white it is translucent right coming on to dentin it is yellow in color then moving on to the floor of the pulp chamber it is gray in color as you can see in the picture also it is light gray in color then the root canal orifices they are actually either dark gray or black in color if we have a pulp stone lying in the pulp chamber of a root uh, of a tooth then the pulp stone usually appears pearly white all this all these features that you can see in the picture they actually comprise what you call as a dentinal map you need to get this map visible when you are making an excess cavity preparation then coming on to the next law there are certain laws of symmetry that have been proposed all the three laws they are basically pointing on to a single purpose the first law of symmetry states that except for the maxillary molars the canal orifices are actually equidistant from a line which is drawn in a mesio distal direction to the floor of the pulp chamber okay. the second law of symmetry states that except for maxillary molars the root canal orifices they actually lie on the line which is perpendicular to a line which we draw in a mesial distal direction to the center of the floor of pulp chamber coming on to the next laws these are the laws for orifice location the first law of orifice location states that the orifices of the root canal they are actually located at a junction what junction the junction between the floor of the pulp chamber and the lateral axial walls coming on to the second law of orifice location the orifices of the root canals are actually located at the angles in the floor and wall junction the third law actually states that the orifices of the root canals are always located at a terminus of roots developmental fusion line now before starting with the excess cavity preparation one needs to have a thorough knowledge of the dental anatomy the pulpal anatomy so there are certain things which actually help us to get that knowledge or understanding about various aspects of the pulpal canal so these things which actually help you to get to the excess cavity preparation are your radiographs i'll say it's better that we use iops or bite wing x rays not opgs because opgs are more helpful in case of orthodontics or in perio problems as they give a better view of the bone loss bone structure and everything for endodontic observations we need mainly iops and bite wing x rays they what are the benefits that they are giving actually x ray is a two, two dimensional view but tooth is a three dimensional structure so iops or bite wing x rays they have no role in helping you to know the number of canals present in a tooth or in a particular root of a tooth they just give you an idea about the curvature of the tooth the complexity of the root canals the accessory canals at times you can also see the accessory canals any presence of a pulp stone can be easily visualized in these x rays it's better if we can go beyond x rays and get a cbct done because this cbct actually allows you to know the actual number of canals which are present within the tooth coming on to after the pre excess evaluation let's move on to the approach what should be our approach when we are doing an excess cavity preparation 
so this preparation is usually done in the lingual surface and the occlusal surface depending upon which tooth you are treating however exceptions are always there if in case the buccal surface is already damaged and more of the carious lesion is present on the buccal surface it is advisable to go through the buccal surface similarly in posterior teeth the guiding factor is always going to be the carious lesion or the old restorative material that is present it has to be removed be it on lingual surface buccal surface mesial or distal surface however for an ideal tooth we just approach to the occlusal surface these approaches are actually the best means of achieving a straight line excess and diminishing aesthetic and restorative concern now this approach it has got three steps the first is penetration we usually start our excess opening with a round bar operating in a very high speed hand tool this is just for penetration into the root canal floor uh, roof of the root canal uh, pulp chamber so while doing the penetration into the floor of the pulp chamber one feels a tactile feeling is there of the drop in effect once you feel that drop in effect it means you have entered into the roof of your pulp chamber moving on to the next step the next step is enlargement of the walls of the pulp chamber now we are shifting from the round bar at a high speed to a round bar at a slow speed because using the same bar at a high speed you may end up removing excessive material from the axial walls of the excess cavity preparation then moving on once we are done with the enlargement we can see all the canals present on the pulpal floor we end up doing the finishing and flaring and it must be done with a non cutting bar non end cutting bar specifically endo z bar i prefer using endo z bar having a safe non end cutting tip then once uh, this is all about excess cavity preparation what all you need to keep in mind when we are starting with the excess cavity preparation but uh, there are certain problems which are associated with all these traditional methods see if somebody asks you how long my tooth is going to last if i am undergoing the root canal treatment the usual answer is maybe 10 years maybe 15 years why not 20 years or 40 years basically most of the root canal treated teeth they fail because they tend to become more brittle and they are more vulnerable to fracture now what is the reason for all this the reason is the structural loss that is given to these root canal treated teeth during the restoration right so what all problems are lying in this traditional methods of preparing the excess cavities let's discuss those problems one by one the problem first is use of very large round bars number 4 number 6 round bars that we are using to enter into the roof of the pulp chamber there lies the problem basically these round bars they do not plane cut they are actually point cut they are actually point cut they try to remove most amount of enamel and dentine specifically dentine in the most critical areas of the tooth that is the dentine which is actually surrounding your crestal bone right plus while destroying with the round bars we tend to touch the axial walls of the pulp chamber and thus removing more of the dentine it is this dentine which is getting removed from the axial walls of the pulp chamber plus from the coronal third of the root canal this is what is pericervicular dentine this needs to be preserved it needs to be preserved because it is most critical in order to absorb the masticatory loads so this violation of this pericervical dentine using the large round bars it is actually causing problem by eliminating most of the sound tooth structure coming on to the next problem that is use of gates gliden drills what is the problem with these gates gliden drills as i have already mentioned that these drills are used since a long time for enlarging the coronal one third of the root canal system however they enlarging the coronal one third they also damage excessive amount of dentine that is present around the crestal bone so the dentine which is see a dentine which is lost in the coronal one third we can replace it with any of the best restorative materials like composites like amalgams or we can give crowns and the dentine that is lost in the buccal one third of the crown, uh, root that can also be replaced to some extent because we have the retrograde filling materials but the dentine that is lying in the coronal one third that is around the crestal bone it is totally replaceable and this is the dentine 
which is actually balancing your tooth during the heavy masticatory loads. So these gate gliden drills actually tend to violate your pericervical dentine, which is actually needed in order to overcome your uh, masticatory load. Now, why complete de-roofing is dangerous? Basically, we say that it is important to completely de-roof the pulp chamber. And this de-roofing is done using your round bird, large round bird. They, using these uh, large round birds, basically, at times, you enter into the axial walls of the pulp chamber. Thus, removal of extra dentine. At times, you are perforating into the floor of the pulp chamber, again damaging the pericervical dentine. Third, it creates certain surface irregularities on the lateral walls. Ultimately, we are doing loss of dentine and compromising the integrity of the pericervical dentine. So one must overcome these problems. Before telling the solutions to all these problems, I want to discuss a few terms with you guys. The first is pericervical dentine. What is this pericervical dentine actually? If you can see in this picture, it is the amount of dentine which is present along the alveolar crestal bone. It is five, uh, 4 mm above the CEJ and 6 mm below the CEJ. Compromising this pericervical dentine is not acceptable because no man-made material can actually replace it. And this is the area where the masticatory loads are going to occur. So there is a tendency of the tooth to break, to fracture at this point. Then coming on to 3D ferrule. What do you understand by ferrule? It is a very commonly used terminology. Ferrule is actually a three-dimensional band of metal, uh, ring-like band, which is actually protecting an object from separating. It is reinforcing the object and prote protecting it from separating. So in uh, excess cavity preparation, what do we mean by a three-dimensional ferrule? It is actually a ring of dentine, which we should leave in the excess cavity preparation. And it has the following dimensions. The vertical component, that is the height of this ferrule or the dentine, should be minimum 1.5 to 2.5 mm. Coming on to the girth, that is the thickness of this dentine, it has to be minimum 1 to 2 mm. Then is total occlusal convergence. What is this? This is basically the taper that you need to place on your axial walls. This taper has to be 10 to 20 degrees. It varies according to the height of dentine. Suppose we have the height of 3 mm. It's better to have a taper of just 10 degrees. In case your height of the dentine increases to 5 mm, we can increase this taper to 20 degrees, but not more than that. Then is soffit. What is soffit? Okay, let's start with the soffit thing. What do you understand by undermined enamel and undermined dentine? See, we know that enamel is a crystalline structure. It is very strong, even stronger than your bone. No matter how much the enamel is strong, undermined enamel is never of any use. However, if we talk about dentine, dentine is actually a bimodal composite. It has certain shock absorbing properties because of its orientation of all the dentinal tubules. So it is always advised to preserve this undermined dentine, then to preserve the undermined enamel. Leaving some amount of this dentine, that is partial de-roofing. It is acceptable, not the complete de-roofing. So we are doing here partial de-roofing, thereby leaving a band of dentine. This band of dentine is actually called soffit. Then moving on to the next topic, that is partial de-roofing and maintenance. It is better to partially de-roof the pulp chamber, thereby leaving a good amount of dentine that is actually forming a soffit, giving a 3D ferrule effect, plus preserving our pericervical dentine, thereby allowing the tooth to bear the masticatory loads in a better way. Now coming on to the recent trends that we guys have for excess cavity preparation. These are basically an, the attempt to overcome the problems associated with your traditional method. First one is the conservative endodontic excess cavity. What is this conservative or constricted excess cavity? This is a type of excess cavity which was introduced by Clark and Khadeni. According to this concept, we start our excess cavity from the central fossa. Once we approach the largest root canal orifice, the canal, we just extend our cavity to involve the other orifices. Thus, protecting as much of the tooth structure, sound tooth structure, as possible. Teeth are accessed 
particularly near the central fossa and extended only to reach your other orifices. Coming on to the next step, that is truss excess cavity preparation. This is a form of excess cavity preparation in which what is done is a truss of dentine is actually left between the root canal orifices. It means that you just have to open up the root canal orifices. The remaining dentine that lies between these root canal orifices, it needs to be preserved. However, there are certain controversies regarding this trust excess cavity preparation. The reason is the dentine that is present between these orifices, it might have an additional canal, it might have an accessory canal like MB2 in case of maxillary molars or middle mesial canal in case of ma uh, mandibular molars. Now coming on to the next, a guided excess cavity. This is a modern form of excess cavity in which we basically use uh, the CBCT of the patient in order to have an idea on how to approach towards the excess cavity preparation. Coming on to the next topic, that is calla lily enamel preparation. It's a modified form of excess cavity preparation in which the enamel margins, the undermined enamel margins are actually given a bevel of 45 degrees. This actually allows to remove all the undermined enamel. It improves your C factor. Plus, it allows you to engage the entire occlusal surface into your restoration, thereby giving better strength to the restoration that you're going to place over the top. So all these modifications, all these recent advances, basically aim to enhance the strength of your tooth that has undergone the root canal treatment so that we are able to improve the prognosis. So here I conclude that successful excess cavity preparation relies on a sound knowledge of the internal and external anatomy of the tooth. The importance of gaining straight line endodontic excess, it cannot be overemphasized. Ultimately, a poor excess cavity design can lead to inadequate cleaning, shaping and obturation, thereby compromising the successful outcome. So now let's just take up the questions. Arush, can you help me? Okay. okay, here we are. Okay, okay, this is a minimal invasive cavity preparation. Okay, this is actually another term for the conservative or the constricted cavity preparation that I've already discussed, in which we are approaching uh, with the smallest size of the round bar through the central fossa and just extending that cavity only to reach the other canals. We are not going to give a large uh, axial walls. We are not going to extend or flare our axial walls. We are just going to limit ourselves to all the root canal orifices. Okay, next please. What are the methods to remove pulp stone? Okay, pulp stone. Okay, it's a very uh, commonly asked question. What is, uh, how can we remove the pulp stone? There are two ways to remove the pulp stone. One, if you, if you want to take out the entire pulp stone, for that, what you need is you need to enlarge your excess cavity preparation so that you can take out the complete junk of your pulp stone. The other method is to crush your pulp stone with a simple round burr. But in that case, there is always a chance of perforating the floor of the pulp chamber because actually you don't know how deep this pulp stone is going to be. So you can attempt using the burrs also. You can attempt enlarging the excess cavity thereby taking out the entire pulp stone with your endodontic instruments like DG16, endodontic spoon excavator, this might help. Okay. The next, please tell me about the main Okay, this ninja excess, ninja excess is a type of excess where we are doing the excess cavity preparation only over the top of your root canal orifices. In order to go for this ninja access, one must have a thorough understanding about the root canal anatomy of the tooth that you are particularly treating. So what you do is, you just create an excess cavity. Taking an example of a maxillary molar, uh, you prepare an excess cavity uh, on the mesial and the distal canal. Right? Now we attempt to take our instrument diagonally from the mesial aspect towards the distal canal. This actually improves your ability to work with that instrument. 
what happens is there is lesser load of the opposing walls on your instrument when you are approaching from the opposite direction so this is the type of excess cavity preparation in which only the canals are open and we are approaching those canals through the opposite direction thereby giving it a ninja shape you can say okay. which birds are best okay uh, to avoid perforation in the pulpal uh, floor basically uh, i'll always recommend endo axis bar endo z bar endo z bar being uh, a non cutting end it has a non cutting end so you can easily place this bar on the floor of your pulp chamber and you can flare your canals and locate your root canal orifices without having the fear of entering into your pulp canal or pulp pulp floor are there in possible root canals or Yes, there are definitely, definitely in the scenario of the COVID time, we have a lot of new protocols. Not specifically for root canals; it is for almost every procedure, every dental procedure that we are doing. So it's better uh, to use high wave suctions in order to just prevent the aerosol contamination, because that is the way how COVID spreads most of the time. Secondly, the dentist who is performing a root canal procedure. he is the one he or she is the one who is most exposed who is most close to the patient so while you are doing the excess cavity preparation specifically you need to wear your mask your respirators in fact i'll say use respirators and use the face shield so that these aerosols uh, they don't reach to your face and mind it that you don't take your hands to your face that is the most important thing to be done next I think we are done with the ninja access endodontics. Pulp stone is done. Okay, concept of single file endodontics. Okay, this is actually single file endodontics. Is we have ample of rotary systems that are available nowadays, and single file endodontics is actually we have certain rotary systems which allow you to. clean and uh, do the biomechanical preparation using a single file that is usually a 4% taper file but these single file systems they need to be uh, done only once you are done with uh, establishing a proper glide path for that you need to do the hand instrumentation first using a 10 number file 15 and followed by 20 then only you can take up the single file endodontic system to do the biomechanical preparation they are good systems but they are particularly useful in case of narrow canals you cannot expect a mandibular molars distal canal uh, to be cleaned by a single file a 4% file or a 6% file you need to take up a series of files to remove the pulp from coronal then middle then apical one third of the canal so what is shamrock preparation okay shamrock pre preparation it is just a form of uh, modified excess cavity preparation basically uh, it is an attempt to prevent the dentine of the opposite wall being act, uh, acting as a strain on the instrument when you insert a file if your excess cavity uh, the wall of the opposite wall of the excess cavity is actually acting on your instrument then there is more chance of instrument fracture in shamrock preparation we have a typical divergence of the opposite walls of the excess cavity preparation so as to avoid the straining of this particular instrument which is going inside the root canal okay uh, different methods of excess cavity preparation for different type of teeth yes surely we can discuss it's a very vast topic and we'll be covering a single tooth starting from maxillary anterior to maxillary posterior and mandibular teeth we'll be definitely discussing them in our coming sessions because that actually needs to give you a lot of time for that we'll be discussing it and you need to wait for the next seminar next arush done so we are done here okay guys it it was good to have you all here and thank you for your patience thank you so much